Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Uh, as Sandy mentioned, uh, I'm Dr. Anderson and I'd like to speak with you tonight about diabetic eye disease and, and how you can try and avoid diabetic eye disease. And unfortunately everyone has to learn a little bit of eye anatomy before we can uh, learn how the disease affects the eye and what you can do to try and prevent it. So uh, this is a cross-section of the eye and basically the eye works a lot like a camera. Uh, this is the front portion of the eye. Uh, light will come into the eye. Light gets focused by this oval shaped structure, the lens of the eye. And light will travel through the eye and become focused onto the back of the eye. Uh, the back of the eye is lined with a very thin tissue called the retina. The retina basically acts a lot like a uh, film in a camera. Uh, so the whole eye works a lot like a camera. Light enters the front of the eye, becomes focused, and it focuses onto the back of the eye, the retina. This uh, middle portion of the eye here is filled with a gel called the vitreous gel. Uh, the eye is constantly making fluid inside the eye to fill the space. New fluid is made and old fluid is drained through a drainage system. And that's important when we talk a little bit about glaucoma. So diabetic eye disease, uh, the symptoms uh, can be simple blurred vision. In fact, the most common thing that diabetic eye disease, uh, or the most common thing that blood sugar can cause to the eyes is if the sugar is fluctuating, if the sugar is changing up and down quite a bit, it'll give simple blurred vision. It's not from any permanent damage to the eye. It's just a symptom that the sugar is changing. And, and many of you may know that if your vision seems to be a little bit blurry, that you should check your blood sugar and, and see, see what's going on. A cataract is when the lens of the eye becomes cloudy. Uh, everyone will get a cataract if they live long enough, but diabetics do tend to get a cataract at a younger age than, than average. A glaucoma is a disease of high eye pressure. It has to do with the fluid circulating inside the eye. Diabetics have been shown to have a higher chance of getting glaucoma. Uh, researchers don't really consider diabetes causative of glaucoma, but they consider it a risk factor for getting glaucoma. And then the main topic that I'd like to discuss tonight is diabetic retinopathy. And that's what most eye doctors are really on the lookout for because diabetic retinopathy can cause a person to lose vision. Diabetic retinal troubles can be treated. And if you catch it at the proper time, uh, the treatment is usually very, very successful. Uh, I'd just like to see with a show of hands, how many of you have had either yourself or a family member or a loved one be affected by diabetic eye disease. Okay, so there are a lot of hands going up and it is a pretty common condition. Uh, in terms of the retina, the retina is filled with small blood vessels. Uh, diabetes can cause changes in these small blood vessels. In the earliest stages, Diabetes causes, causes small dilations of vessels. If the diabetes progresses in the retina, it can cause blockage of blood vessels. It can cause leakage of fluid from blood vessels. And, and the end result is sometimes the blood vessels will actually break and you can get bleeding in the back of the eye in the retina from diabetes. In the worst form of diabetic retinopathy, the body tries to grow abnormal, well, it's trying to grow new blood vessels 
and new healthy blood vessels to help the blood flow in the retina, but unfortunately the body's effort is, is not good. These, these new blood vessels that sometimes grow, they are very abnormal. They like to leak a lot of fluid and they like to, to bleed. Uh, and so formation of new blood vessels is, is not a good sign in somebody who has diabetic retinopathy. Now this is a picture of an eye with a dilated pupil. The pupil's been dilated with drops at the doctor office. This whole white area here is just a severe clouding of the lens of the eye. If you remember back to the anatomy slide, that oval structure that I mentioned focuses light for the eye, that's called the lens of the eye. It's clear for most of a person's lifetime uh, with age and sometimes with diabetes this lens of the eye becomes cloudy. Now this is a severe cataract. This person can hardly see at all with such a severe cataract. Nowadays we usually don't see, eye doctors don't usually see cataracts this bad because we have cataract surgery which is a successful procedure and people have their cataracts out before they cause uh, such severe blurring and blocking of the vision. But this is a picture of a severe cataract. Now this is a, an optic nerve. In the back of the eye, as I mentioned, there is a structure, the retina. It's like a thin wallpaper on the back wall of the eye. It works like a film in a camera. Everything you look at is focused onto your retina. Then the next step in processing vision is the retina sends all these vision nerves to pile together into a cable, a large cable of, of about one million vision nerves all coming together and that is called the optic nerve. So this structure here is the optic nerve sitting in the center of the retina. And if you notice, there's a thin sort of pinkish rim around the edge of the optic nerve, and then there's this large pale center in the middle of the optic nerve. Uh, glaucoma is a disease that damages the optic nerve. Usually, glaucoma damage comes because of high eye pressure and diabetes is a risk factor for developing uh, glaucoma and high eye pressure. The high eye pressure actually physically pushes on the optic nerve and, and causes damage. Uh, an ophthalmologist will know that this is someone who has glaucoma because this pale center is much, much larger than average. That pale center is a sign of damage to the optic nerve and, and in this particular case, it looks textbook for glaucoma damage. Now, some statistics about uh, diabetes. There's approximately 16 million Americans who have diabetes, and unfortunately, that number keeps going up. Uh, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in the age group 25 to 74. There are approximately 1.2 million diabetics who have retinopathy that requires treatment. Uh, and approximately 8,000 eyes become blind per year due to diabetic retinopathy. Uh, both type 1 and type 2 diabetics can get diabetic retinopathy. Uh, there's an increased risk for retinopathy in African Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanic Americans. There's an equal prevalence between men and women. Uh, it makes sense that the longer a person has diabetes, the more likely it's going to affect the eyes. And that's the case. When they research it, about 75% of type 1 diabetics have some form of retinopathy after 15 years of being diabetic, uh, nearly 100% after 30 years of being diabetic. And with type 2 diabetics, about 40% have retinopathy after 15 years. Now this doesn't mean that it's severe retinopathy or there's loss of vision. Uh, it just means there's some form of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, one real important fact is that in the early stages, there are no symptoms with diabetic retinopathy. An eye doctor will see retinal findings on an examination before you, a person would notice any kind of blurred vision or any symptoms at all. Uh, if retinopathy advances to intermediate stages, the main symptom is, is blurred vision. Nothing specific, no spots, no areas of more severe loss, just sort of general blurred vision in intermediate stages. 
And if the retinopathy progresses, people can get floaters, either large or small. That can happen from bleeding in the eye. Uh, you can get severe blurred vision uh, from blood vessel damage from, from the retinopathy in the advanced stages. Now this is a, a normal retina. You can see the optic nerve in the middle here, and this is a healthy looking optic nerve. That pale center is actually quite small, nowhere near as large as, as the one in the glaucoma slide. This is a much wider angle photo, so you can actually see all this retinal tissue around the optic nerve. So this whole reddish area with all these uh, dark red blood vessels that surround the optic nerve, that, this whole area is the retina. This is a normal retina. It has a nice even background to it. The blood vessels are, are gracefully curving, um, and this is the way a retina should look. There are two main forms of diabetic retinopathy. The milder form called the non-proliferative or background form, and then the proliferative form, which is the, the type where uh, you can get abnormal blood vessels growing. This is a photograph of fairly severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the optic nerve is off to the side in this photograph, and you can see that that nice even red background that was on the previous photo, this looks nothing like that. Uh, these yellowish spots here, those are areas of leakage from blood vessels. Uh, not only does fluid leak from blood vessels, so does protein, and proteins that come out of the blood vessels uh, lead to these yellowish spots. Uh, you can see smaller hemorrhages in different parts of the eye, these red patches. And then down here, there are a couple of sort of fluffy white patches, whitish patches. These are actual areas where blood vessels have been completely plugged up and there's no blood flow in that area. So again, in the non-proliferative form, it begins with dilation of small vessels. Uh, those actual dilated areas are called microaneurysms. If the retinopathy progresses to the moderate stage, you can get leakage and bleeding of small vessels. And that's where the little yellow patches were on that past uh, photograph. Uh, severe non-proliferative retinopathy can lead to blockage of small vessels. And those little fluffy white patches, we call them cotton wool spots because they look like cotton wool. And that's a sign of actual blockage of the blood vessels. Um, now this is a photo of very mild retinopathy. Uh, this is a, an artifact. This is just a little fixation uh, area for people to, to look at when their pictures are being taken, so this is not actually part of the retina, that dark line. Um, if you look carefully, uh, there are some smaller, just little tiny red dilated dots around here. Not too many of them. There's one that's a little more noticeable right there. Those are microaneurysms. They're dilations of vessels. There's no real bleeding or leakage going on. And this person will have perfectly normal vision. There's no symptoms with this at all. This is more moderate. Now we start getting some of the leakage with these yellowish patches, lots of smudged uh, broken blood vessels leading to small hemorrhages, uh, but no total blockage of vessels in this moderate form. And then this is the same photograph again from the advanced form. Uh, these cotton wool spots, these fluffy white patches, uh, that's the sign of switching over to a more severe form. And uh, this person here would most likely have some, some blurred vision, uh, perhaps not severe, but there would be some symptoms by this stage here. Uh, the more severe form, the more advanced form, is again called proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That's when you get neovascularization, meaning growth of new abnormal blood vessels. Basically, it's the body trying to help, trying to improve blood flow to the back of the eye, but in the effort to bring new blood to the back of the eye, unfortunately, the blood vessels uh, that form are, are, are abnormal and end up causing more problems than good. Uh, you can get abnormal blood vessel formation on the optic nerve itself. The optic nerve is also known as the optic disc. You can also get abnormal blood vessel formation uh, away from the optic nerve on the retina itself. So on this slide here, you can see that there's almost 
it's an almost entire lacy network of blood vessels that are that are encircling the optic nerve here. Uh, these fine curled blood vessels are not normal. Those are abnormal vessels. Uh, here there are some abnormal blood vessels growing out. This, this has been long standing in this particular case. There's also a little bit of scar tissue building up in there, but there are abnormal blood vessels inside these scar tissue bands, and that's neovascularization elsewhere. And the problem with neovascularization is it, it leads to larger patches of bleeding. Uh, this is a patch of blood sitting right on top of the retina, and that's for bleeding from neovascularization elsewhere. That's actually a pretty small hemorrhage for the proliferative form. They can get uh, larger than that. So how do you get diabetic retinopathy diagnosed, and how do doctors decide if a person needs treatment or not? Uh, the most important part of, of having your eyes checked for diabetes is to have a complete eye examination, including dilating drops, uh, checking your vision, checking your pressure, which is a test for glaucoma. Through a dilated pupil, an ophthalmologist can get a really good, really high magnification view of, of the retina, and most of the diagnosis is made just by the eye physician taking a look and, and seeing diabetic retinopathy. Uh, there are some other tests usually done by retina specialists where, uh, if necessary, the leaking or bleeding blood vessels can be really pinpointed with great accuracy. And one of these tests is an intravenous fluorescein angiogram. Basically, a uh, safe vegetable dye is injected into a vein right in the office, and a lot of bright flash pictures are taken as this dye goes through the blood vessels of the eye. And this is a, a slide of an intravenous fluorescein angiogram. Uh, you can see that all the blood vessels now are just lighting up very brightly as the dye goes through them. And every one of these little tiny stars, these little white patches all over the place, there's a large cluster of them. Yeah, every one of those little bright spots is a, is a dilated blood vessel or an area of bleeding. Uh, and retina specialists use this information for treatment of diabetic retinopathy. The risk factors for diabetic eye disease or duration of the diabetes, as, as we already discussed, poor glucose control. Uh, for the longest time, research actually could not prove that poor glucose control made a big difference with diabetic retinopathy and diabetic eye disease. But good studies, well-designed studies, have now proven once and for all that the better the blood sugar control, the lower the chance of getting diabetic eye disease. Now, people with high blood pressure, high cholesterol or high lipids, people with uh, diabetic kidney disease, and uh, pregnant women are at a higher risk of getting uh, diabetic retinopathy. I get a lot of diabetic patients who say, my blood pressure wasn't even high and my primary care doctor put me on blood pressure medicine. And I say, you've got a good primary care doctor because uh, for people who have borderline high blood pressure, borderline high cholesterol and diabetes, you, you really need all, all three of those situations under real strict control. It's been proven that that helps prevent complications down the road. So for prevention of diabetic eye disease, good Good glucose control is a must. Control the blood pressure, control the lipids, the cholesterol, the triglycerides, and have your annual dilated eye exam. And of course, part of good glucose control includes watching the diet, getting exercise for people who are overweight, losing weight, that all goes into glucose control in addition to medications if, if a primary care doctor feels that that's necessary. So the treatment of diabetic retinopathy, in mild cases, there, there is no treatment needed. It doesn't cause a problem. There are a lot of diabetics who will get mild retinopathy. It'll never worsen. It never is a problem for them. So you don't have to treat it in its early stages. You just watch. And, and, uh, and as an eye doctor, I encourage people to be sure they maintain good sugar control and just good control of, of their diabetes in general. Uh, if a person is getting a lot of leakage near the central retina, 
Then there is a laser treatment called focal laser. It's where usually, again, a retina specialist would aim a very low level medical laser at areas of leakage. And the laser actually can help stop the leakage. Sometimes they can actually cauterize a, a leaking blood vessel. Uh, and that helps clear up the swelling in some forms of the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, for people who have the abnormal blood vessel growth, it, it takes a different type of laser called panretinal laser, and that means widespread laser. Uh, more laser is needed, a little higher strength of laser is needed, and, and that can be used to obliterate these abnormal new blood vessels, make them shrivel up and go away. There are medications that can be used either by themselves or with laser treatment uh, using cortisones or steroids, using medicines that are actually related to natural hormones in your own body. Uh, and these hormones actually carry a signal and just tell the body, shut off abnormal blood vessel growth. Uh, those are called anti-vascular endothelial growth factor medications or anti-VEGF medications. And then enzymes can be used to dissolve bleeding and, and help treat uh, retinopathy as well. Uh, in severe cases of retinopathy, sometimes surgery is required. Uh, a procedure called a vitrectomy can, can remove extensive bleeding from within the eye. Uh, and for some people who get a lot of scarring in the back of their eye, the, the diabetic retinopathy can actually pull a, a detachment into the, into the retina and retinal detachments can be repaired uh, surgically. Uh, this is a picture of the widespread laser. Every one of these little tiny spots is a little tiny laser burn. And you can see there's, there's hundreds of them here. This is used to treat the neovascularization. Um, this person still has some abnormal uh, curly blood vessels here along the optic nerve, uh, but those vessels should regress with treatment. This is pretty pretty fresh treatment. This person probably just had their laser right at the time of the picture there. You'll notice they, they treat the periphery and they leave the central retina untouched. And that's because the central retina is the most important part of your retina. That's what you use for your good vision, your central vision when you're looking straight at somebody's face or reading letters on a page. Uh, you, they try not to laser the central retina unless absolutely necessary to preserve your vision. Uh, there are some complications of laser treatment. That's why it's not done unless a person reaches the stage uh, where the treatment is needed. Uh, most of these complications are from the widespread laser because that is a higher energy laser and it requires more of those laser spots to work. So some people notice they lose a little peripheral vision with laser treatment. Some people notice that their night vision isn't as good after laser treatment. Um, you can have swelling in the back of the eye. The widespread laser, some people do get pain with that laser. It's usually short-lived and, and goes away quickly. Uh, you can also have little tiny blind spots just off to the center of your straight-ahead vision uh, with the focal form. The focal form, again, is to try and clear up some swelling uh, toward the central retina. They use low-level laser. They try not to put too much laser in there. Um, but sometimes people do notice a couple of little tiny blind spots just off to the center of their vision with the focal form of laser. Uh, this is a compilation of, of all the studies that I reviewed for our talk tonight. Um, it says that the widespread laser reduces the risk of severe vision loss by 50% to 90%. Nowadays, with better technique, uh, and catching the neovascularization more quickly, uh, the success rate is more toward the 90% range of, of, of this what this slide shows. The focal laser reduces vision loss due to swelling by over 50%. And again, a lot of this is older data. The newer studies, it, it's, it's a, a higher percentage. They're getting better and better using laser and also combining it with some of those other medical treatments. So the success rates are, are going up and up with the procedures nowadays. So the, the conclusions that I take from this talk is that, first of all, diabetic retinopathy is common. When I asked people in the audience, a lot of people raised their hands. They've been affected by 
diabetes or a family member or a loved one. Um, glucose control, it, it's very, very important. It has been proven that the better the blood sugar control, the less likely a person gets diabetic eye trouble. That's the most important preventive measure is, is keeping the blood glucose under control. Treatment is most successful when the retinopathy is found early and monitored. Uh, and when you treat it, you want to treat it right when the retinopathy meets the requirements necessary to go ahead with treatment. It's a lot easier to prevent vision loss and prevent severe retinopathy if you catch it at just the right time. If somebody has already had a lot of damage, it's a lot harder bringing back vision and, and most of the time you, you can't bring back the vision. The, the goal is to catch it early. If somebody's already had damage, unfortunately the goal becomes keep the vision where it is. You can't really expect to get much improvement. Um, some cases there is improvement too, but the, the main idea is catch it early. Uh, the best way to catch it early is to have your annual dilated eye exam, uh, have your eye physician take a look and, and do that every year.